It's September 15th, 1935, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ollie, the Retrospectors. The symbol we now know as the swastika has been used by different cultures for at least 7,000 years, appearing as a sacred shape in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Odinism, and also showing up on artefacts from pre-Christian European cultures as well. But after that long and almost entirely blameless existence, it was today in history in 1935 that, well, had this been the age of the internet, the swastika would have got itself well and truly cancelled, because this was the day that it officially became the flag of Nazi Germany. Yeah, this was one of the Nuremberg laws enacted in a special session of the Reichstag called during the party's annual Nuremberg rally. Interestingly, the Associated Press report from the Times says the Führer had no other purpose originally in summoning the Reichstag to meet here Sunday, his associates said. Other topics, the nature of which has not yet been made clear, were added later. The other topics would turn out to be stripping German Jews of basically all of their civil rights, but it was really framed around the idea that this Nuremberg rally and the Nuremberg laws were primarily about making the swastika the official flag of Germany. And in a strange mingling of the two items on the agenda... One of the anti-Jewish laws banned Jews from flying the new flag, which you can imagine probably wouldn't have been the foremost concern on their minds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, you've said that I can't marry my uh, non-Jewish uh, girlfriend and also that I can no longer be considered German. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm really upset because I can't fly your flag. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the swastika had been the symbol of the Nazi party since 1920 and was designed by... Adolf Hitler personally, not the swastika part of it, as we've been saying, but the combination of that with the colours from the former German imperial flag to create the admittedly, I will, I will grudgingly admit, Ollie. very striking flag. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> and Hitler needed something as strong as the hammer and sickle. Um, and I guess turn to the swastika because, and this is the thing that really surprised me, it had been getting a bit of independent traction in Europe in the decades prior to this. I sort of always knew that it was an Indian symbol before it was a Nazi symbol. I had no idea that it was used also by the ancient Greeks and the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons. There's a Bronze Age swastika stone on Ilkley Moor in Yorkshire. But in this particular period of German history, people were like, oh yeah, swastikas, they're great. Yeah, it had had this real resurgence in the 19th century, kind of as a result of growing European interest in the ancient civilizations of the Near East and India. And during his uh, really intensive excavations, the German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann discovered the cross on the ancient site of Troy, you know, the, the one that saw the battles between Paris and Achilles. And he connected it with similar shapes that had been found on pottery in Germany and speculated that it was a significant religious symbol to our very remote ancestors. And other European scholars and thinkers linked the symbol to what they imagined was a shared Aryan culture that spanned from Europe to Asia. And in the beginning of the 20th century, the swastika was widely used across Europe. It just had like multiple meanings, the, the most common of which being that it was a symbol of good luck and auspiciousness. Yeah, European scholars had first noticed similarities between Sanskrit and many European languages in the 1500s. And by the early 19th century, they developed this notion of a shared linguistic ancestor, Indo-European. And that had obvious implications to the idea that there was also a shared ethnic lineage. I mean, obviously, everyone on the planet is somehow related if you go out far enough. But the idea of the Aryan people sort of arose around this time kind of as a way for Europeans to cushion the idea that they were related to Indian people. So the Aryan people were a real ethnic group of ancient northern India who spoke Sanskrit, they practiced Hinduism, but they were kind of reimagined by Europeans, repurposed in being this superior, light-skinned elite who are basically white. German thinkers were the ones who really took this and ran with it, and it went into these very like, unscientific, unhistoric uh, theories that these proto-Aryan people, you know, the ultimate ancestor, were actually Nordic, you know, they'd somehow then gone to northern India, so they were European in the end, they were practically German, and this wasn't the case over the rest of Europe, so, so the swastika had this separate journey in Germany because scholars there really took this idea and ran 
with it. Whereas in the rest of Europe and the Western world, it was just seen as a popular decorative motif. Mm. And this had the unfortunate side effect of it being adopted by some well-meaning sports teams like the Windsor Swastikas and the Fernie Swastikas, both Canadian ice hockey teams whose problematic jerseys you can probably picture. Carlsberg <laughs> used a swastika as their logo until the 30s. In fact, there are still yeah. stone elephants with swastikas carved on them at the gates of the company's HQ in Copenhagen. Yeah, it crops up in the weirdest places once you start looking for it. The Girls Club of America even had a magazine called Swastika and would send out swastika badges to their young readers as a prize for shilling copies of the magazine around town. There are even swastikas, and this is an interesting one, on the wall of Chelmsford County Hall in Essex. Um, Mm. And they were put up in 1939, extraordinarily. Mm. That was actually subject to a freedom of information request in 2014 because someone pointed out, well, surely by 1939 people knew that there was a wrong and repurposing the swastika. Why did they decide to put that up on a county hall in Essex? Well, actually, there there was a large (laughs) Dublin laundry business founded in 1912 called Swastika Laundry. And in 1939, apparently, you know, feeling the pressure, but not willing to give up the name recognition that they had built up for themselves, they changed (laughs) their name to the Swastika Laundry brackets 1912. And that remained its name until it closed in 1987. All press is good press, you guys. <laughs> it's, it's really taking off in Germany, but I think we can probably style this one out. And the issue for a while was that there were two officially recognised German flags, one being the swastika one and one being the old imperial German flag. This led to issues where other countries just weren't recognising or respecting the swastika version. And there had been these high profile protests. So two months before this date, and this is supposedly part of what motivated Hitler to pass this law and make the swastika called the official national flag, anti-Nazi demonstrators in New York City had rushed the German ocean liner SS Bremen, ripped the swastika flag down and tossed it into the Hudson River. The five people involved were, they had to appear before a magistrate who just dismissed them all without charge. He called it a pirate flag, so his sympathies were very, you know, obvious. But because the flag had that dual status with the old imperial flag, the US were able to smooth over that diplomatic incident on the grounds Mm. that, you know, the real flag, the imperial flag, had remained unharmed. Yeah, because the the Nazi one was, I suppose, the political flag. That's how it was seen, wasn't it? That's the party, Mm. but not the country. Yeah, exactly. And so now, you know, there was only one German national flag, the swastika flag. And then so there followed this weird few years. You know, World War II hadn't started. The swastika was not simply the emblem of an enemy nation yet. There was this little period where it was just the flag of another country in Europe. So you had Mm. scenes like in December 1935 when England and Germany played a friendly at White Hart Lane. The swastika flag was flying over the stadium. There are photos of it, you know. And it was Mm. interesting because there were protests at the time, you know, from Jewish groups and from their sympathetic allies. But it's kind of a funny echo of what happens now often in the press when there are, you know, political controversies over sport. The Weekly Herald noted that, quote, the Jewish protest has received little sympathy amongst the general football public who resent the introduction into sport of such a controversy. Mm. (laughs) And sometimes it definitely crossed into a little too cosy. In 1938, the England football team drew criticism for joining their German counterparts in a Nazi salute at the return fixture in Berlin. They said they'd been ordered to do so by the FA. Yeah, I mean, quite a lot of the symbolism of Nazism and Germany was coming together in ways that, to some extent, the Nazi party were happy with, but also they wanted to keep control over this very specific and increasingly popular symbol. And actually in 1938, they'd passed legislation that was aimed at preventing private advertisers as well as companies and individuals from using the swastika to sell products because it was all over everything. It was on coffee, cigarettes, you know, cake pans. Well, also, again, to briefly hand it to Hitler, you know, we talked about this with the CND logo as well, didn't we? That the simplicity of being able to draw something is Mm. really important in a political symbol. And... I was about to say it's drawable by anyone. I'm pleased I've never tried to draw a swastika. But, um, you know, theoretically, uh, if you're that way inclined, it is a uh, similarly simple thing, isn't it, to scrawl on a subway platform and then run away. And that remains the case now. It's one of the resonant things about it still, in terms of its visual language is you, you can deface a Jewish cemetery with that very quickly. Yeah, I mm. mean, it was picked up very quickly by nationalist groups in other countries. But interestingly, in the early and mid-30s, displaying the swastika was banned in Austria and Hungary. In both cases, though, it was due to the fact that they had foreign, i.e. German, and anti-Christian associations, rather than any concerns about Nazi ideology. 
But in the 1950s, some motorcycle gangs in the US wore the swastika to highlight their just their outlaw nature. And you had a similar thing that went on in the 1970s when like some punk rock performers mm. and enthusiasts openly displayed it as a symbol not of, you know, necessarily Aryan pride, but as just sort of raw youthful rebellion against the status quo. It's easy to see how... It's just like the most provocative thing you can put on my sleeve. You well, know. exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I saw a fascinating thing, which was that there's now a movement called Learn to Love the Swastika Day. Uh, one adherent, Peter Madsen, is the owner of a, an upmarket tattoo parlour in Copenhagen. And he says that... You know, when you hear the word tattoo in the same sentence as swastika, <laughs> I'm not sure it does. Well, those are vibes that I'd want to be involved oh, with. Oh, man, it gets worse. So he links it to, like, the sort of Norse mythology um, pre history and wants it to be dissociated from what the Nazis did with it. And so he mm. came too soon. He was one of the it. Yeah. He was one of the founders <laughs> of the Learn to Love the Swastika Day, which is part 13th of the 13th of November, if anyone wants to get involved. <laughs> For those in that. who celebrate. And he and a bunch of tattoo artists around the world offer free swastikas to raise awareness of the symbols like multicultural past. I mean surely the person who should be raising awareness of the multicultural past are people who still use it in its multicultural sense, right? I mean, right. you know, if an Indian tattooist wanted people to have more swastika tattoos, I'd have a little bit more sympathy. I also just go with your too soon argument. I reckon let's just give it another thousand years, I reckon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, there are other know. campaigns to jump on. <laughs> yeah, and other tattoos are available. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so another week of retrospecting ends. But next week begins a day early at Club Retrospectors. Join us now to get an exclusive episode every Sunday. Patreon.com slash retrospectors.